So this morning we're continuing chapter 35. And as I mentioned last week, in many ways at this point we start a new section of Tanya. Because here the Alter Rebbe goes back to basics. And after everything we've explained, he returns to the opening of the book, which is the notion of... I'm going to give a page number in a second. That this Yiddishkeit business is exceedingly close to each and every one of us. And we started on the bottom of page 156 in the Hebrew, it was 155 in the English. And we moved into page 158, if you're following the page numbers on the bottom, or 157 in the English. And the big question that we left off last week is what is the point? What is the point? That Bain and he toils and he works so hard. And he seems to get absolutely nowhere. There is no real change. He's f- struggling with the same Yetzirah, with the same issues. In fact, it's the same issues since childhood. They just got a little fancier. <laughs> People just, now it's bigger toys. It's bigger concerns, bigger lusts, different kind of jealousies. It's the same thing. And you seem to be getting absolutely nowhere. So what is the point? Why bother? Why did Hashem send a pure and holy neshama to exist within a body that is sniveling and selfish and mean-spirited and only cares about itself so that the neshama is ever vexed. And yes, it's true, it does have temporary victories and the neshama sometimes does overcome the challenges of the body, but he does, it's, it's never really a, complete, a completed mission. And the next day, he's at it all over again. So there's a beautiful teaching from Simcha Burim Bapshischa where he said that a person has to feel as if his head is placed in the guillotine. And at any moment, the, the sword's coming down, you know, the proverbial sword of Democles is coming down on him. So someone in the Hasidim said to him, what if I don't feel the way? He said, then your head's already off. <laughs> 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 and, the point, and the point being that we cannot relax in our Vedas Hashem. It's like a person who's at the front in a military sense, and you're trying to prevent the, an enemy attack. Your finger's ever on the trigger. You never know what happens. The next moment, everything could change. You have to be in the strongest level of hypervigilance because if we, for even a moment, relent, everything comes crashing down. So in other words, there's this concept of, of, of vigilance that has to accompany, that has to accompany our Avedis Hashem on a regular basis. And, and that hypervigilance is something that we can never ever cease to be committed to. And in, in Cain, says Alter Rebbe, Lama yarda, Lama za Why didn't the Shama come down to Elam Haza? Liga Lorik, to seemingly toil in vain. Chas v'shalom. Lihilochem kol yemehem, to battle all of their days. Imma Yetzer, with the Yetzahara. Vala yuchlulay, but you can never defeat the Yetzahara. So what's the point? It's like so much frustration today in Israel. Israel has, has declared itself to be a country. It's tried to provide for its citizens. It's had enormous strides forward in just about every area, except there's no peace, there's no security. The terrorists are ever at it, and they simply don't relent. The, the, the suicide bombers are stopped for a wall. They find a way to shoot rockets over the wall. You find a way to shoot down the rockets, they're digging tunnels underneath. It's like it's endless. These people won't relent. They want every Jew in the sea. They want, they want, they want a river to sea to be, to be nothing else. That's what they want. And, and not only that, they're even winning the battle of public, public opinion. They even have the world behind them. It helps to have anti-Semitism on your side. It's like a, you start off with a huge jump ahead, but they've also been very clever about it. And, and it's like, it's, it's, it's impossible. What's the point? Endless fighting, endless struggling, and people are tired. People, they can't fight anymore, so let's just make peace. But you know that, that peace is not going to be a peace. That peace will be Rahman al murder, mayhem, and destruction. If you get a quiet week, you'll be lucky. We got nothing. People, Jews abandoned. 10,000 Jews were tossed out of their homes in, in, in the Gaza Strip. What do we get from it? Thousands of rockets. More murder. More mayhem. Doesn't make any sense. So in a certain, in a certain way, this is what life's about for a Benini. The Benini is trying to find some peace and quiet and solitude. He wants to just find some serenity. He doesn't want to fight with his Yetzirah anymore. Enough with the Yetzirah. Leave me alone. Let me just be. Let me just be a good, fine, nice Yid. Let me just learn Torah, do mitzvahs, get along with everybody. Why do I have to have these issues, endless issues? 
Now the tzaddik indeed breaks the atmosphere. The tzaddik doesn't struggle the way a regular person struggles, and the tzaddik's avodas Hashem. The toil and effort in serving Hashem is very different from the benini. Please don't ask me what it is, because I don't know. I'm not a tzaddik. Tzaddikim know what this is. The Alter Rebbe wrote a special book called Sefer Shel Tzaddikim, and he talked about their avoda, what they, how they have to toil, and they work as hard as the benini, maybe harder, but it's in a very different playing field. It's a different game. We're not there. So we who are all Bainanim, or potential Bainanim at least, the, 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 the most we could accomplish is to have a perfect scorecard. Halavai. The most, the best we could ever get is that we should be doing everything as we're supposed to. That means we don't have any bad thoughts. It doesn't mean the bad thoughts don't come. They, don't, they come endlessly. That we're being bombarded with them, but you're supposed to shoot them down. And you're supposed to knock it out. And you're supposed to push your, close your mind to it and not choose to ruminate on it. So the thoughts of selfishness and the thoughts of lust and the thoughts of cravings and the thoughts of desires and, and all kinds of unhealthy things, they'll come your way and you have to push it out of your mind. Not ruminating, not thinking about that. That's not appropriate. It's not, that doesn't belong. I'm a yid, I'm a chassid. Nothing doing, pushing it away. And it comes again, and you push it away again. And obviously, you would never say anything which is inappropriate. You would never speak any gossip. You would never say something, words that are hurtful. You would never say anything which is driven by anger or frustration. Chas v'shalom, you would never say anything like that. Everything he says is exactly the way Hashem wants it to be. And do? What can I talk about? Never do. You would never eat anything you shouldn't eat. You would never go anywhere you shouldn't go. You would never look anywhere you shouldn't look. You would never listen to anything you shouldn't listen to. The Bain has got a perfect scorecard. So already, we're kind of out of the running. But in theory... <laughs> In theory, we could achieve this. We could achieve this. In theory, that would be the best. That would be the Olympic level of Avedis Hashem, the highest level we could achieve. But we'll never achieve mastery over the animal soul, that the animal soul is no longer an animal soul. That'll never happen. The Yitzhahara will ever be there, lurking at the corner. And just in case you think you got some kind of small victory and you actually elevated things just a little bit, don't worry, the Yitzhahara's got a new game. He's coming back. He, he, he's still got game. He's questioning if you have game. He, 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 you figured out one detail, that's okay. There's many other windows, many other chimneys for him to get into. So you're going to have to constantly be on the vigilant lookout. You know, there was a, a game when I was a kid that his heads would pop up. You have to bang, bang, bang the heads down. That's what it's like. You're banging the heads down. This way, the it's a hard rears, ugly head here. You're smacking down, and now he's somewhere else. And, it, and, and, and it's continuous. It's continuous. So, so what's the point? <coughs> So the Alter Rebbe says, zois, zois This should be your comfort. He's here, he says, I'm here to console you now. To bring you a double measure of consolation. that In a kind of consolation that will not only make you feel better, but actually serve as a shot in the arm. It'll give you newfound strength. Libam. Alter Rebbe wants us to be happy because if, if you're not joyous, you can't serve Hashem properly. So we should find joy by Hashem HaSheikh and Itam in God, in God's presence, who dwells with us, in the midst of our Torah study, despite the fact that it's fraught, in the midst of our service to Hashem, despite the fact that each and every moment is another battle, Hashem's presence dwells amongst us. And al Rebbe is here going to do something unusual. He's going to give us an excerpt of the Zohar, a chunk of Zohar. And the chunk of Zohar is going to be a teaching of the Yenukah, the Inuka was this little baby, this little child who was like light years ahead of everybody else. And he had extraordinary spiritual aptitude and incredible insight. And he became a great teacher. And they would listen to what this holy Inuka, this holy child would say. And he would say all kinds of amazing things that nobody could fathom. And his teachings, some of his teachings are recorded in the Zohar. So there's a discussion who exactly this Inuka was. But it was, it was a child of some of the great, great sages and very, very special people. At any rate, the Lashon HaYinuka, which is in the Zohar, and Parshas Balak, it reads like this. It's on the Pasuk. It's on the verse, Hachacham Einav Bereshe. That the, the wise person's eyes are in his head, which of course comes from Ecclesiastics. That's a verse from Shlomo HaMelech, the wisest of people. And the Yenuka said, like, said like this. V'chi ba'an asar de barnash. Where else are the eyes of a person? if not in the head, in his elbows, in his chest. Like, this is such a profound statement by the wisest of people. Hachacham, the wise person, ain't of Bereshe. His eyes are in his head. Wow, Shlomo. I mean, with Shlomo HaMelech, I would think that maybe your eyes are in your back. Maybe they're in your biceps. But, but the wise person, and if you're not a wise person, then your eyes are where? They're not in your head. 
What does it mean, a chachamein of Bereshe? Where else are a person's eyes? So the Inuka says, Ela, kra hachihu. This is really what the Pasuk, what the verse means to say. This is the proper interpretation. Vadai de tenan lo yahach barnash begilu deresha. We have learned that a person, and specifically we speak here about a man, must not walk even four cubits when he's bareheaded. Begilu deresha arba amas. Why should he not walk bareheaded? And we know that Avraham Avinu and Yitzchak and Yankev all covered their head. And actually, there's something interesting. My, my, my father was a, a baby in a DP camp. He was, came, out, came out of Russia as a refugee in a DP camp. And he was in a German town or camp called Pucking. So in Pucking, there were barracks, army barracks for German soldiers. There were very bare, empty barracks. And uh, this is where the Jewish refugees were living. I think thousands of refugees. I don't even know how many refugees. But at, at some portion of the camp, there was a group of the remnants of the Lubavitch Hasidim. And they were in a long barracks with sheets between, was, there wasn't rooms, it was a barracks. But each family lived between two sheets. So, so the sheets hanging from the wall that my grandparents lived in, and my father as a baby, and the, and the sheet next door was the Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Sachana. So Rabbi Tzachana told my father many times, do you remember? Remember I used to chase you? Do you remember I used to put a yarmulke on your head? <laughs> my father didn't remember, but the Rebbe Tzachana reminded my father many times. So one of the things that Rabbi Tzachana told my grandmother is that I heard from my husband that a child, a little boy, should never go out bareheaded. He should always have what she called a hitler, always have a little hat. He should never go out bareheaded. So if I'll try to tell whoever he could, people should know that the, the, the Levick said, the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's father said, a little boy shouldn't go out bareheaded. But there's this business of, you know, in, in life, an uh, observant Jew doesn't walk, a frumigid doesn't walk with bareheaded. He doesn't walk even for Amis bareheaded. My time, why does he have to make sure that he has a covering on his head? So the Zohar, the Inuka said, the Shekhinta Sharia Areshe, because the Shekhinta rests on his head. And because the Shechina rests on his head, as a respect for the Shechina, so therefore he has to wear a yarmulke, he has to wear a kippah. And then the Yunuka said, V'chal chacham inuhi umilui b'reshe. So every, the wise man's eyes, and really everything he possesses, because our knowledge is the most powerful resource we have, and at the end of the day, the most powerful organ we have is the brain, and without a brain, he ain't worth very much. So, so the, everything that the wise person possesses is in his eyes and essentially his, his eyes and his, and his brain is in his head. In other words, inon bahahu the sharia of a In other words, that, that he must, in, in his head is where the shechina is. In other words, the shechina, when we talk about the shechina, the shechina means consciousness. So the consciousness that a person has, appropriate consciousness, is, is the Shekhinah. That's, that's how you can have God in your life. You can have God in your life when the Shekhinah is in your head, when you, so to speak, have an elevated state of consciousness, a state of awareness of Hashem's presence. So, Kad inoi tamon lenada da'ahuna heira da'adlika reisha. So he says the, that now if his eyes are there, which means he sees this, it's not literally, it's a figurative thing. You, you see this. You, can, you, can, you grasp it. You understand it. So then he must know that the, there's the light that burns or shines above his head. It needs oil. Begin the gufa, the barnash, iupsila. Because the, the physical, corporeal reality of a person is metaphorized as a wick. adlik It's a wick. And on top of the wick, there's a candle that's burning, and the candle that's kindled above it. Veshloima Malka Tzavach Vaomar, and Shloima Hamelach is crying out and saying, Veshemen Al Reishcha Al Yechaser. Make sure that there's always plenty of oil above your head. The Hanahira the Bereishe Itzrech Lemishcha, because the can the candle or the light on your head needs oil. Okay, what is the oil? And so he finished off the inuk and he said, "Ve'inon uvdan tavon." These are the good deeds. And that's the meaning 
that the wise man's eyes are fixed in his head. Ad kan l'shoinei. Here's where the quotation ends. All right. So it's like like most like most of Zohar. What in heaven does that mean? <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? Pasuk says your eyes in your head. So the Yunuka said, where else would eyes be? She said, okay, here's what the thing is. You have to have and have to know that there's a halo. There's a candle. There's a light that glows above your head. And Shleim HaMelech says, have your eyes in your head. See this, see this reality and make sure that there's plenty of oil at all times. So the first and obvious question is that we see here that the, this business of, of the Shekhinah, of God's presence is metaphorized as a light, obviously a metaphor. And the body is metaphorized as a wick. And the oil is the good deeds. What's the obvious question we could ask? Why do you need oil which is good deeds? In other words, to fuel the fire. Why can't? Why can't the neshama itself be the fuel? What do you need good deeds for? You have a neshama. Neshama fuels shechina. We have to keep having good deeds. Let's, let's do a little further inside. Vihine. Bir mashal zeh. The explanation of this parable, this metaphor that the Zohar gives us. That metaphorizes and compares the light of the Shekhinah, obviously a proverbial concept, not literal, euphemistic, certainly, to the light of a lamp. It doesn't illuminate, it doesn't glow, it's not able to burn without having oil. And so too, clearly what's being conveyed is, the Shechina cannot reside on the body of a person. Who is metaphorized as a wick. Only through good deeds. It's not enough to Neshama. The Neshama is not enough to fuel the Shechina. You need to have mitzvahs being performed. Good deeds. Shehi, the Neshama is a chelik imal. The neshama is a portion, a piece of God from on high. But despite the fact that the neshama is a piece of God from on high, the neshama itself is not enough to keep the shechina going. In order to keep the shechina, the presence of God going in your life, that it should be like oil. So, so the obvious question is why? What, what is the neshama missing that good deeds have? Or, or, or differently put, how are good deeds able to fuel the Shekhinah more so than the Neshama, which is actually a piece of God? So the Alter Rebbe says, Mavur umuvan l'chol maskil. So it's clear, it's understood and explained to every wise person. Kihine nishma sa'adam, the Neshama of a person. Afilu tzadigam, or even if he is a complete tzadik. He's Eved Hashem, Be'yire Ve'ava Be'tainugim. He serves God with a sense of awe, a sense of reverence. He serves God with a sense of love, with a sense of excitement, a sense of exuberance to the point that he delights in his Avedis Hashem. Afal Pikein, Eni Betelu B'Metzias Legamri. He is still not totally nullified before the light of Hashem. Libatel V'likolel. Libatel V'likolel. That he should become totally absorbed into Oir Hashem Mamash, the, the proverbial, euphemistic light of God, that it should be in a state of oneness, beyichud gomor. Rak, who dover befne atzmei, he remains something independent of God, yire Hashem ve'ehave, he who reveres Hashem and he who loves him. I'm going to go a little bit further inside the text and then we're going to explain this all. Masha'en kenan mitzvahs. However, when we talk about the mitzvahs, we talk about the maizim toivim, the good deeds. Shehein ritzayni yizbarech, this is the will of God. Veritzayni yizbarech, the will of God. Hu moker hachayim l'chol o'ilumis. The will of God is what makes everything exist. Because God wills it to exist, that's why it exists. Vahabiruyim, and all that is created, sheyered aleim. Al yedetzim sumim rabim. All of this happens through an extraordinary level of divine concealment of Hester Panam Shoratzna Elyon, and Yeridis Amadreges, and the lowering of levels, at Shiyuchlulis Havos Librois Yeshmaayan, till such point as godliness is so concealed that a world can be brought into existence ex nihilo, as it were. Vilayivatlu, Vilayivtlu Bimitsias Kanal, they will not be totally eclipsed or overwhelmed by the presence of God, so that they're not able to exist independently. Mashaykin on mitzvahs. However, the mitzvahs, which that is the inner will of God, there's no concealment. 
The vitality of the mitzvah is not separate and apart. It is totally absorbed into and made one with the will of God. It becomes totally as one and inseparable. What in heaven did I just read to you? Okay. So, in order to understand what we're talking about, which is, namely, what we're trying to get at is the distinction between good deeds and between the neshama. So, let me take you back to the beginning. Remember we had our frustration? We're talking about our frustration. The endless point. Life, like a gerbil, going in circles. It's not going anywhere. We're not accomplishing anything. Now the Rebbe said, relax. Now listen to this. First, a czar. Without going into the nuances and details of the czar, what is clear from the czar is that in order for the shechina, in order for God's presence to dwell on a person, what is required? Good deeds. Only mitzvahs will bring God's presence into your life. That is to say, that in the Zohar's metaphor, the body is a locale, a repository, a place where God's presence can rest. You can be a base amigdash. But in order for you to be a base amigdash, in order for Hashem's presence to be upon you, and he talked about this halo, proverbially, that, that glows, or, or a candle, like a lamp burning above your head, you need to constantly have a few, uh, 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 few it has fuel that light. A constant supply of fuel. And the constant supply of fuel, those are the good deeds, those are the mitzvahs you do. The mitzvahs, the commandments of Hashem that you observe, that constantly fuels the light of Hashem, which brings God's presence into your life, and not the neshama. Not the neshama. So this is an obvious question. We have to explain what's the difference between the neshama and between a good deed, between a mitzvah. It's a pretty sunny day for a change. Don't get used to it, of course, unless you're going to Florida. But right now, it's, the sun is shining in Ontario, and probably the remnants of the snow will melt today. And then we'll get two days, and then it will snow again. This is how it is. Now, if you go outside in this cold but sunny day, and you strike a match or light a candle, how much light will be added to your environment? Virtually nothing. Why? Because the light of the sun is so much greater than the light of your candle that it actually is meaningless. Sometimes, for whatever reason, the, cities, the street lights don't go off. But sometimes the timer is off. If it's not a sense, it doesn't work by sensors, a light, a night light could be burning during the day. Nobody knows the difference. Unless you look at the light, you can see if it's on or off. But being down below, where the light usually shares its warm glow, it usually bathes something in its light during the night. During the day, you cannot even see if it's on or off. The sun goes down, and suddenly what happens? Light appears. Do you think that the light appears when the sun goes down? Was the light here before? Of course it was here before. Why didn't you see it? Because there was too much light. Or so, such a greater volume of light that the smaller amount of light simply couldn't be noticed. Similarly, in the presence of God, our neshamas do not resonate. We, we, the, our neshamas aren't separate. When, when everything is light, so then there's just more light. The light is absorbed into the greater light. There is no independent light. You wouldn't see it as something in and of itself. In order for the neshama to feel like a neshama, in order for the neshama to feel independent, in order for the neshama to have the ability to choose between right and between wrong, what needs to happen? The sun needs to go down. The sun needs to be hidden. The sunlight needs to be taken away. This is the concept of tzimtzum. On a very simple level, this is the notion of God's concealment. It's a mystical, Kabbalistic idea, but it's very easy to understand. It's very easy. Without tzimtzum, without God restraining His light, we wouldn't be. The world couldn't be. The world today is so profoundly real that people who analyze the world, whether it's natural sciences or philosophers, come to the conclusion often that there is no God. How could that be? If it's true that there's a God, then it's true that God wills us into existence, that God makes everything exist each and every single moment, how is it possible that examining the evidence shows you no proof of the truth? The answer is, it's the tzimtzum, stupid, as they say. It's the tzimtzum. Because God concealed himself. Where is God? I don't know where he is. How did he then he doesn't exist? No, you fool. He's everywhere. The fact that he's God allows him to be everywhere and you shouldn't see it. If a person were to come into a circumstance of great chaos and be able to take hold, whether it's a mob or a company gone out of control or whatever it might be, 
very skilled, very gifted, amazing person with a phenomenal aptitude and is able to pull it all together. It would be very clear that this is the person who made everything change. And if that person was taken out of the equation, everything collapses again. It's very obvious. Now imagine putting a person like that and he comes into the scene, he turns everything over and nobody knows he's there. That's impossible. It's not, it's, we can't fathom such a thing. How would it be possible for a person to do all that, to organize all these things, to make everything work, but nobody should even know he's there? In fact, you would say, who is more skilled? The person who can come in and build up everything or the person who can build everything and you don't know he's there? The latter, obviously, is far more skilled. It's much, much more difficult to do something and not be seen. And that's the meaning of hein hein gvuraisa. This is the idea of gvura. The God's concealment is more powerful than His creation. Hashem Elikim, in some ways, is more powerful than Hashem Avaya. The, the, the ability to be able to conceal godliness is even more astounding than the fact that God brings the universe into existence. Now, you understand then, in order for an neshama to exist, forget that the world exists, even an neshama to exist, let's say we have an neshama of a tzaddik. The tzaddik loves Hashem with every fiber of his or her being. This is a human being who lives only for God, who thinks never of themselves, who has a life of, of, of deprivation and maybe he's missing all kinds of things that other people would like to have, never stops to think about it for a moment, never complains, is always happy, doesn't know what's wrong, doesn't know anything's wrong. Why? Because the only thing that's relevant and meaningful in life is they can serve God. Serve God here, serve God there, doesn't make a difference. Hatzadik le says, Hatzadik doesn't make a difference. Circumstances are bad, it doesn't affect the Tzadik. Tzadik's living in a different place. His body is here, he's living somewhere else. It's a level we can't even fathom. It's beyond imagination. So even that Tzadik, he still loves Hashem. So there's a he or a she, there's an I. And that I can only exist because of a Tzimtzum. If there wouldn't be a Tzimtzum, there could be no I. Because if the sun is shining, then there's no lamp. There's no light. I mean, the light is there, but nobody can see it. So even the tzaddik who has the most amazing reverence, the most amazing awe for Hashem, he lives in a sense of constant trepidation. He feels the presence of God all times in his life. Never for a moment, never would he do anything wrong. He feels Hashem's presence. He feels Hashem looking at him every single moment. The tzaddik still is an I. I fear. I revere. I respect. So there's always still a little bit of I. And no matter how close the tzaddik gets to God, there has to be some I. This is called in the language of Hasidus, Yesh Misha Oyev. There's still a lover. He loves God. He's totally committed. He's ready to give everything away. But he's still, I'm giving everything away. There's still an I. Now that's only possible because of Tzimtzum. But the mitzvahs themselves, the mitzvahs have no independence whatsoever. The mitzvah is actually the will of God. We talked many times about the idea of chitzen yisodotzen and pnim yisodotzen. The truth is there are many levels. I'm simplifying something very complex now. But the, an, a, a simply stated, a person goes to work. Why does he go to work? He goes to work because he needs to make a living. Why does he need to make a living? Because he needs a roof over his head. Because there's, there's a family he has to provide for. Because he needs food. Whatever. There's, there's the things that life needs. So that's why he goes to work. So he says, where, where, where are you going now? I want to go to work now. You want to go to work now? Well, I, I mean, I don't want to go to work, but yeah, yeah, I want to go to work now. Why do you want to go to work? I want to go to work so I can provide to my family. So what happens if I'll take care of everything? You don't have to go to work. Well, how am I provi provided? It's taken care of. It's done. Oh, you're still going to go to work? 99% of the people say, no, I should go to work for. I only went to work. I didn't really want to go to work. I wanted to provide to my family. If I can find another way to provide to my family, they're not going to work. There's a ridiculous story that's told about uh, one of the Rothschilds who was in Israel and he met a bum on the beach in Tel Aviv. This was like in the 1920s. And he said, hey bum, why don't you get, uh, get a job, get a life? And the guy said, why would I do that for? He said, what are you talking about? You get a life, you'll, you'll, you'll have a house. He said, so? So you have a house, maybe you can get married, you have a family, so? And he keeps telling him all the things he's going to have if he has a job and he has a life. And, and, this, and then, and then, and then, and finally he says to the bum, and then you'll be happy. The bum says, I'm happy already. <laughs> Why should I bother? I'm happy now. Why do I have to work hard to be happy? Obviously, a ridiculous way to look at life. The point of the, of the story, though, is all these things are called chitzen yasaratsan. What's pnim yasaratsan? What does a person really want? The person, let's say, really wants that inner joy and satisfaction. And here's the way he gets that enjoying satisfaction. Here's the way he feels good. Here's the way he feels that he's actually made a contribution. It's all about ultimately feeling good. It's all about feeling fulfilled, which is the highest level of, of, of joy, really. 
It's not, it's not uh, experiencing a, an artificial sensation which comes and goes, but rather it's a lasting joy. Like Yiddish Anachas, you can't compare it. No candy tastes as good. Right? As a Yiddish Anachas, a sense that you have family, you have children, you have grandchildren. That's, that's what life's about. Okay? It's, it's almost indescribable. So when we talk about a mitzvah, we're talking about not chitzayni yisaratzen, but pnimi yisaratzen. So what does God really want with a whole, this whole creation business? What is the ultimate goal? What does God want right now, in fact? God wants right now from us exactly what we're doing. He wants us to be sitting and studying Torah. And in a few minutes, He wants us to be davening, doing a mitzvah. So the mitzvah that Hashem wants at any particular time, in the night of Pesach, what does God want? He wants Yidin to be eating matzah. That's what He wants. Are they from? I don't know. The Rebbe didn't care. The Rebbe knew that on the night of Pesach, Hashem wants Yidin eating matzah. So what did the Rebbe do? He devoted every fiber of his being and every fiber of anybody who would listen to him to make sure that every Yid in the world should have matzah. Why? Because that's what Hashem wants tonight. He wants Yidin to eat matzah. And soon will be Hanukkah. And what does Hashem want? He wants a menorah to be lit. Every single Yid in the world... Huh? And Sifganiyot. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm not going to laugh at Sifganiyot. It's a, it's a mini Yisrael. Yes. And apparently the safe in Rambam, the Rambam's father said that it has uh, great uh, propitions and it brings along a, no problem. Mm-hmm. Minhag Yisrael. Yes, all for Erchan Gigel too. But that's for sure. What does Hashem want? He wants these things to be done. Now, does the menorah need to feel independent of God in order for it to be a mitzvah? The menorah doesn't have any feelings. The menorah is not a yesh mishayiv. It's not an I am now going to illuminate. The matzah is not, I am now going to be chomped on. It's, it is actually the will of Hashem. It doesn't require any tzimtzum. It doesn't require any concealment. It is straightforward, open and over the will of Hashem. And so this is what the Altareb is telling you. He's saying to the essence of creation, which allows the Shekhinah to exist, cannot even be the tzaddik. can't be the neshama. Why? What happens to the oil that feeds the fuel, that fuels the, the light? What happens? The oil is fueling the, the light. What happens to that oil? It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. But if, would it be good if the neshama was gone? That wouldn't be a good thing. The neshama can't burn up. The neshama has to still feel an eye. If you would get absorbed into divinity or get burnt into God, if the neshama is scorched and burnt, what's left? Nothing. That's not even a view. Nadav and Aviyu, the sons of Aaron, came with great fervor, got swept up into the Ketoros. They became the Ketoros. No good. No good. Hashem wants the Rishamah to be here. He wants the Rishamah to feel independent. He doesn't want the Rishamah to go into a, a, a feeling of spiritual ecstasy in which it takes leave of its, of, 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 of its existence in a physical, literal way. But that exactly is the point then. In order for the neshama to be able to actualize and bring the presence of God, it needs to bring something to the table that doesn't have to exist altogether on its own. And what's the only thing that can actually be burnt, that can fuel the fire to the point that it isn't? It's not a person. What is it? It's the maizim tev, it's the mitzvahs. So you're saying, oh, what do I need all these mitzvahs for? Now that I'm saying, the mitzvahs are what fuels the shechina. That's exactly the point. Now, especially today, people want to have experiences. And people need to feel good about things. So a person, well, I don't feel it. I'm doing a mitzvah. It doesn't talk to me. It doesn't make me feel spiritual. So what, what would you say to them? So it doesn't matter what you feel like. It's not about you. It's about bringing the Shekhinah into this world. And guess how the Shekhinah comes? When the mitzvah is performed. And if you do it with a greater sense of duty and a greater sense of obedience, that brings even more Shekhinah into the world. Because there's less I. You know, there's a very simple metaphor for this. Today you have food which tastes delicious and it's pure garbage. Call it fast food. Call it candy, cake. It's garbage. It actually will destroy your body. If all you eat is garbage food, you literally will die years earlier. <clears throat> literally. Because you can be, your body's barely being nourished. You could, you could probably starve to death on some of this food. You could eat uh, cotton candy and die of starvation. But you'd be very happy. Kid will keep stuffing his face with cotton candy, keep getting sugar highs, and body will be drained to the point where it has no nutrition whatsoever, and literally the body will die, the person will starve. So how does that work? How does that work? Because nutrition and taste have nothing to do with one another. Something could be very nutritious and not be very tasty, but it's very healthy and keeps you going. Something could be very, very tasty and have virtually no nutritious value whatsoever. So if a person wants to stay alive, wants to stay healthy, what does he need to do? You need to eat. Now, 
it's understood that if the food isn't tasty, people probably won't eat well. So that's the way God built us. We, human beings, in our limitations, will like to eat things which taste good and don't like to eat things which taste bad. So we don't want to just eat nutritious things. We want to eat tasty things. We want to have an appetite. No problem. No problem. The Abish gave you taste buds and you're allowed to eat and you're allowed to enjoy. Just make sure that it doesn't become the focus of life. And on Shabbos, that enjoyment is even a way to serve Hashem. All beautiful. That's great. But you should know that nutrition and, 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 and appetite and, and, and taste are not necessarily linked to one another. There are people, Rahman al who lose an appetite or people who are bulimic and they literally starve to death. It's a tragic reality. Young people struggle with this. Struggle with, with, with feelings of, of inadequacy, of feeling, of feeling overweight, of feeling they're not fitting into some impossible paradigm which the Western world has created for them and they, can't, they, can't, they, can't, they don't feel good about themselves. So they feel horrible about themselves, so they starve themselves to death. So what's so great about that? Who feels good in the end? Nobody. So feeling good has nothing to do with what actually is good. And this is even true in a physical, material sense. Now, now multiply that many-fold when we talk about spirituality. Whether you feel good about something or not is totally irrelevant. The person says, ah, oh, this mitzvah really talks to me. When I, when, when I do this mitzvah, I really feel close to God. I don't know what that means even. Who cares what you feel close to God? Now, it's nice to feel close to God when you do a mitzvah, and sometimes you're lucky enough to, just like it's nice for the food to taste good. But still, the mother is forcing her kids to eat the porridge because the porridge is good for them. And the garbage they want to eat is bad for them. And at a certain point, you can't force your kids anymore. They're on their own now. They do whatever they want. So what does a parent try to tell a child to do? Do mitzvahs. And the kids, I don't want to do mitzvahs. And what do you try to do? You try to give them a taste for mitzvahs. You try to give them a fervor, a, a passion for mitzvahs. You try to teach a child healthy eating habits. So when the child gets, it becomes a habit, he doesn't need to have cake and candy and ice cream three times a day. He learns to eat normal food. He learns to appreciate normal food. So an education means a child learns to appreciate the value and the beauty of a mitzvah. But don't worry, the Yitzhahara doesn't go to sleep. The Yitzhahara is ever trying to throw things at us. Ah, it doesn't taste so good. It doesn't feel so good. Do something that feels good. And you have today, Rahman al what I call pseudo-Judaism. This is the original fake Judaism. Non-halachic, non-Torah, not what Hashem wants, but it tastes great. It feels fantastic. I feel so Jewish. There's nothing to it. It's literally junk food without an ounce of nutritional value for the neshama. It doesn't bring the shekin into your life. Ultimately, the goal in life is to bring the Shekhinah. And this is what we have to know. And that's what Shleim HaMalach meant. You have to have your eyes in your head. You have to see the reality as it is. Not imagine things to yourself. If you see reality as it is, if you know that the Shekhinah is actualized through performance of mitzvahs, and you have the opportunity to do mitzvahs, instead of walking around morose and with a long nose and saying, I'm unhappy, I'm not getting fulfilled, I'm not being able to achieve the mastery as I want, instead a person realizes, wow, I have the opportunity to do a mitzvah. When I do that, the Shekhinah resonates within me. To be continued.